Hey, it's Alan, and I just wanted to let you know that you can now listen to the ongoing history of new music early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. I vividly remember sitting down to write the first ever episode of the ongoing history of new music. I was in my living room. I had a pen in my hand and a blank yellow notepad. I was terrified. To be brutally honest, I did not want this gig. But the powers that be decreed that this was my new job. And if I didn't want to do it, okay, that's cool. I was told I'd receive a manila envelope containing a modest severance package. Well, that wouldn't work. I'd just gotten married and I'd just bought a house with a 12.5% mortgage. And I'd done radio all my life. So I really didn't have a lot of skills for any other line of work. So I told the bosses reluctantly that, okay, I'll do it. What other choice did I have? So there I am, sitting, looking at this blank yellow notepad. This was before the internet and before anybody started writing books on the history of alternative music. So (laughs) where to start? How to organize everything? And how could I come up with something every single week? But what's that quote from the ancient Chinese philosopher Lao Tzu? A journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. So I took a step. I started scribbling notes. A few days later, I had a script for the first episode of the ongoing history of new music. And I decided that the best way to begin, for me more than anything else, was to make a pilot, a show that laid out what the program would be. It was a total guess. I had no idea where this thing was going to go. None. I figured I'd do the show for a couple of years and then move on to something else. People would get tired of it. It would outlive its usefulness or I'd just end up getting fired for real this time. But here we are, 30 years later, and I'm still doing ongoing history shows. And as I sit here, it's February 2023, and we're about 30-ish episodes away from ongoing history show number 1,000, which will happen sometime in November. Things have changed a lot since I wrote and recorded that first episode. Things that we'll get into when we get to show number 1,000. But for now, to mark 30 years since that first episode aired, We've pulled the recording from the archives and are making it available for the first time as a podcast. God, you know, the concept of podcast was still years away when we started this. So just for fun, let's take a listen to the very first program, Ongoing History Show number 001, broadcast on February 28th, 1993. I hope this isn't too cringy. Something big happened on November 6th, 1975. Although at the time, no one really had any idea of what was going on. It took place in London at an art school called St. Martin's. Thursday night, small upstairs room, about a dozen people there. No one was expecting an opening act. They were all there to see the headliners, a group called Bazooka Joe that featured a singer by the name of Adam Ant. When that first band came on, they lasted about two songs. That was how long it took before the school's social programmer decided that everyone had heard enough and pulled the plug. Shut them down. The name of that band was the Sex Pistols. And despite the fact that their first live gig wasn't much of a hit, music was never to be quite the same. This is the Ongoing History of New Music Podcast with Alan Cross. Welcome to the Ongoing History of New Music. I'm Alan Cross, and it's going to be our mission to track what happened to music between punk and the present. Now think about it. Think about how much the new music scene has changed over the years. It started with bands like the Ramones and the Sex Pistols and Blondie. And now, thanks to them and many others, we have groups like the Chili Peppers and Pearl Jam, R.E.M., Ministry, Smashing Pumpkins, Jesus Jones, and and thousands more. But how did we get here? What happened between the jam and Jane's Addiction? What do the dead boys have to do with Depeche Mode? And while we're at it, what was so important about the Sex Pistols anyway? All these questions have answers. Here's one. 
A computer operator was waiting for a train on the morning of December 2nd, 1976, and he was thinking about the Sex Pistols. They had been in a popular TV show the night before and had said a couple of bad words. Now, this had caused quite a scandal. All of Britain was talking about it. Terrible, terrible, these young men on TV. But this guy thought it was great. These guys had shaken up the system. And on that ride to work, he decided that he didn't want to be a data entry clerk. He wanted to be involved in whatever it was that the Sex Pistols embodied. The attitude, the anger, the energy. Shortly thereafter, an inspired Declan McManus quit his computer job, picked up a guitar, and changed his name to Elvis Costello. Here's another example of how punk helped shape the music that we have today. Bernie saw the Sex Pistols play in Manchester in the spring of 1976. He says, oh, they were terrible. I thought they were great. I wanted to get up there and be terrible too. He and his friend Peter, who was also at the show, decided to give it a shot. Well, if they could do it, well, maybe we could. Their first group was called Warsaw. Warsaw became Joy Division. Joy Division became the order. Here's one more story about how the punk scene set up a domino effect that helps explain the new music that we have today. A bunch of guys lived in a flat at 101 Walterton Terrace in London, and they played in a group which they called, appropriately enough, the 101ers. And one night, they had a gig at a club called Nashville. The Sex Pistols were the opening act that night, and Joe, the guitar player, was just blown away. Not by their musicianship, because, well, frankly, they were awful. It was their attitude and their energy that grabbed his attention. A few days later, Joe left the 101ers and started to work on a new band with a couple of people who also thought that the Sex Pistols were great. First, they called themselves the Psychotic Negatives. But that didn't work. After that, it was the Weak Heart Drops, the Outsiders, and then the Mirrors and the Evening Standards. And then one of the guys suggested, how about the Clash? Yeah. That's The Clash, and one of the first songs they ever did together, an early demo recording of Career Opportunities from 1977. This is the kind of history that we'll be doing, stories that explain why today's music is the way it is. And we'll hear a lot of rare recordings along the way, and you know, some of this stuff has been unavailable for years. In fact, when we come back, a version of a song that was to become the first ever single from Susie and the Banshees. This is a look at episode number one of the ongoing history of new music, first broadcast on February 28th, 1993, so 30 years ago. This is going by pretty quick, uh, but I'll say it again. There wasn't much to go on when I wrote this first program. I had some magazines and a couple of filing cabinets filled with record company press releases. I still have those filing cabinets, by the way. I haven't opened any of them for years, but I just can't bear to throw them out. They were my lifeline. My wife thinks they're a fire hazard, and they probably are, but to me, those cabinets saved my life and turned everything around into, well, whatever it is I'm doing today. Let's continue with some cringe. That's an early version of Hong Kong Garden by Susie and the Banshees. That was recorded live at the BBC long before it was properly recorded and released as the band's first single. Susie Sue is another person with connections to the Sex Pistols. She was one of their first fans. And if you had seen that TV show where the Pistols swore at the host, the one that Elvis Costello saw, you would have seen her in the audience. David used to live in Rhode Island with Chris and Martina while they were all going to art school. Eventually, they formed a group and they moved to New York where they spent a lot of time playing gigs at a scuzzy little club where all the cool people hung out. Between sets, David would sit at the bar and show everyone how he could draw a detailed map of the United States with his Etch-A-Sketch. It's David Byrne we're talking about. His band was the Talking Heads.
Another thing you'll hear from the ongoing history of new music are special programs featuring bands like, uh, well, the Talking Heads, the Smiths, the Cure, the Sex Pistols, the Ramones, and many others. For example, here's a taste of our Depeche Mode program. Do you know why they switched from being a guitar band? One, we felt that guitars restricted us. You know, the sound of the guitar is very limited. And uh, we found synthesizers very, very interesting, just the sounds that you could get on them. And secondly, we had a lot of problems, sort of transport-wise, getting somebody to, to take us around with all our amplifiers and things for the guitars. And um, we could just take the synths under our arms on a train and uh, just turn up and plug direct into a, into a PA system. And it was just a lot easier in the early days. We also have a program planned on REM. Ever wonder where the name REM came from and what it means? Came out of the dictionary. About three o'clock in the morning, we were we had our first show the next night, and we still didn't have a name, and we couldn't think of one, so we we picked that one up because we figured nobody else in the world would ever use it. Well, in the dictionary, it means rapid eye movement, but uh, but we just grabbed it because it was short. That's a very young REM from the days when they were still playing clubs, which is a whole lot better than these days when they don't play live at all. Back in a moment with more of our preview as to what to expect with the ongoing history of new music. Listening to the first ever ongoing history program is a bit triggering because I had no idea what I was doing or where things were going. Consider this to be some audio archaeology and some radio history, and it's not always pretty. So let's go back again to Sunday, February 28th, 1993. As you can probably tell, we have access to a huge variety of recordings and interviews. And amongst all the material that we have is some pretty strange stuff. And you can bet that we're going to share it with you. Now, check this out. This is Aztec Camera doing a cover version. They're doing their impression of Van Halen. We're also going to spend some time tracing family trees. Look at Bauhaus, for example. Bauhaus splintered into Tones on Tail and Love and Rockets and indirectly gave us Peter Murphy, David Jay, and Daniel Ash. Talking Heads, uh, David Byrne has a solo career. Jerry Harrison does stuff on his own. And Chris and Tina are the Tom Tom Club. And before there was a Paul Weller, the solo artist, there was a band called the Paul Weller Movement. That evolved out of the Style Council, which all began with this band, The Jam. Along with tracing the rise and fall of various bands, we're going to look at some of the trends in music since punk. Trends like power pop, the new romantics, hardcore, industrial, cold wave, synth bands, and one of my favorite art forms, ska. But whatever happened to ska anyway? Well, we'll answer that in an upcoming program. Well, there you go. A quick idea of what you can expect from the ongoing history of new music. A lot of cool stories, plenty of interviews, rare recordings, and some wonderful music. I think you'll find it fascinating and a lot of fun. There you go. A look back at the first ever ongoing history of new music program. First broadcast, Sunday, February 28th, 1993. You might well wonder what came after, and I'll tell you. It was a year-by-year -year history of alt-rock starting in the early 1970s. And once I got up to the current date, I think this took until late 1993, I moved into changing up topics every week. People always ask if we're going to post all the shows as podcasts, and the answer is no. Why? Well, first of all, because a lot of those episodes are terribly out of date. And frankly, the writing and production got so much better over the years. Resurrecting these old, outdated programs would not do the brand any favors, if you know what I mean. But we will continue to sort through the archive and pluck out programs that still work today. Oh, thanks to Craig Venn. He was the technical producer for this first show and the next 109 episodes. And from episode 111 and on, it's been Rob Johnston. 
He has turned several hundred radio shows into podcasts. You can download them all, which I heartily recommend. And finally, comments are welcome at alan at alancross.ca. Thanks for listening to number one. Next up, number 900 and something. You've been listening to the Ongoing History of New Music podcast with Alan Cross. Subscribe to the podcast through iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, and everywhere you find your favorite podcasts.